Good afternoon, welcome. Thanks for giving up your lunch time, Friday lunch time. Uh, my name's Ed Baker. I'm a strength and conditioning coach for Performance Hertfordshire. If you don't know who we are, we're in the, the Haviland building around the corner. Um, I work with uh, Tony Sefton and Fiona Scott, and we are uh, all strength and conditioning coaches looking after high performance athletes that use the facility. Um, I have a parallel interest in nutrition, and I used to lecture at Middlesex University. Hi. Uh, and also lecture for UK Athletics um, as their guest speaker on nutrition, so it's a sort of personal topic, personal passion of mine. That's why Rianne's uh, been so kind to invite me to speak to you. So I don't want this to come across like a finger-wagging lecture, so it's meant to be uh, as informative as possible. Uh, so don't feel like I'm you know, trying to get at you in any way in what I say uh, or that I'm criticising, I think that what you're doing is wrong or right. Uh, it's more just uh, presenting uh, the optimum way to do it and you're free to choose, obviously, uh, to take on board as much of it or as little as you want. I want to make it quite informal, so if a question occurs to you, then you can, uh, don't wait till the end, uh, just ask me and then we'll make it more discursive and uh, that way you won't forget that burning question. Similarly, if you disagree violently with what I have to say, then by all means, speak up, don't hide it under a bushel. Also, if you agree with what I say, you can feel free to whoop and applaud, etc. <laughs> So I've tried to structure it around the questions, uh, uh, comments that Rianne sent to me from some of the um, people that engage with her over this. So we'll look at breakfast, options for breakfast. Uh, the classic argument, should I have carbs after five o'clock or uh, you know, that five o'clock is an arbitrary number, carbohydrates in the evening. I think you hear that a lot in magazines, etc. So we'll discuss that. Um, why am I not losing weight? If, you think that you may be doing the right things and if you are one of those people that is trying to lose weight and you're not, you can ask me today and we'll try and find the answer to the question. I can't promise you that we will find it, but we can try. And looking at the magic uh, metabolism, do we have a fast meta metabolism, a slow metabolism? How can we speed it up? How do we slow it down? So we'll try and answer those questions. So we'll start with breakfast. I'm not going to ask you what you all have for breakfast today so you can relax. However, I am going to reference one of the email questions that Rianne sent to me. Uh, and that was about shreddies. I put 16 shreddies there because uh, it's helpfully written on the side of the cereal packet. Um, so many grams of something per portion. And you think, fine. Then you look at the portion size and they dictate the portion to be, I don't know what it was, 25 grams. Somebody was um, obsessive compulsive enough to count out <laughs> how many that was, and it totals 16 shreddies. And as we all know, a grown adult cannot go about their daily business on 16 shreddies. That's really the end. That's really all I need to say about that. I'll, I'll go into why uh, later on. But we all know that the portions that they give out are ridiculous, and therefore that should tell you something about whether that food is going to be good for you or not. Um, we all eat cereal in the morning, don't we? That's what you just eat for breakfast, is cereal. Okay. Why is that? Is it because it's what you should eat in the morning? Or is it more than likely Kellogg spends £50 million a year on advertising? And we all think that that's what we should be eating in the morning. Just to give you a potted history of why we eat cereal. John Harvey Kellogg was part of the American temperance movement in the late 19th century, okay? based in the Midwest US. He and his followers tried to come up with a cure for what they thought was the evils of the day. Masturbation, uh, thief, theft, burglary, um, thinking impure thoughts. Okay? So they came up with a pressed uh, cereal food that could be manufactured and sold for 10 times the cost of its ingredients. Nowadays, as they've refined the process, the profit margin of cereal is closer to 45 times. Okay? That's 45 times the cost of the ingredients you get back in profit, which is one of the main reasons why it's ubiquitous and everywhere and everybody eats it. And it's quite a good point to make at this juncture that wherever you see an enormous company like Starbucks with a unit on every corner of every street in the country. It's best, all right, I drink it too. Uh, it's, it's best to take a step back and think, 
is this because this is a normal food that I should be eating every day, or is this because of clever marketing uh, and uh, a big budget? Cereal, commercial cereal like cornflakes, uh, shreddies, frosties, cocoa pops, etc., etc., cannot be considered food. I think that's a main st uh, staple of this talk today: is that you cannot consider cereal food because by the time it gets in the box. Uh, it no longer bears any relation to a natural product. So the process uh, is that the grains have all the fatty acids, which are the nutri nutritious part, removed, because they're the bits that would go rancid if left on the shelf. Then the grain, once the German uh, fatty acids are removed, is steam cooked. Um, it's then rolled, pressed, and then flame toasted at over 300 degrees centigrade. And then it's crushed into the shape that it's going to be. And then after that, sugar uh, and uh, synthetic vitamins are sprayed onto it. Um, and that's why they put fortified with so and so and so and so. So that's lesson number one. Never buy anything with fortified with or added written on the side of it. Because if they've had to add something chemical to it after they've cooked it, that means there can be no nutritional value in the food whatsoever to start with. That's a simple marketing trick to fool you into buying something to say fortified with vitamins and iron. It tells you that there's nothing in the food of any value. You cannot absorb synthetic vitamins particularly well. It's much better if you get them uh, from the food that you eat. Now everyone's thinking, well, what the hell do I eat? Cereal is what we eat for breakfast. Well, before 1867, it wasn't, okay? And it doesn't have to be that way. We're going to talk a little bit about uh, these two things, glycemic index, GI, and glycemic load. Has anybody heard of glycemic index? I think it's reasonably popular uh, to hear about low GI, high GI, those sorts of things. Okay? Um, so I'm going to show you a table in a minute and explain to you a little bit about that. And we're also going to talk about a hormone um, that everyone has called insulin, apart from, obviously, diabetics who need to inject it. And we're also going to talk a little bit about protein. Okay, so those are the three things relative to breakfast uh, that make up um, the cornerstone of my argument for what you should and shouldn't eat for breakfast. So glycemic index, what does that refer to? That is the speed at which carbohydrates are absorbed into the bloodstream. Okay, and it's a man-made um, scale uh, from 1 to 100. 100 is the speed of glucose, so pure glucose, like uh, a Lucozate energy tablet. Uh, table sugar is two types of sugar mixed together, so that's actually a little bit lower than 100. So 100 is pure glucose. And all other foods are then ranked on that scale, uh, as in how fast they are absorbed in the body relative to glucose. Okay? So the lower the figure for glycemic index, the slower sugar is absorbed within the blood. Glycemic load is the thing that you never hear about but it's quite an important part of it. Glycemic load is the amount of sugar per gram of any food. Okay? So to give you an example, think about our watermelon. Okay? has a, quite a high uh, glycemic index. The, sh the sugars are fairly rapidly absorbed in a watermelon. However, 98% of a watermelon is water, so there's not very much sugar in it. Okay? So it's possible to have foods that are quite rapidly, abs rapidly absorbed, but they don't contain very many carbohydrates. Conversely, you might have something like cornflakes, which have no fiber and are very high in sugar, and therefore very rapidly absorbed, and also contain a lot of carbohydrates. So where I'm going with this, whenever you consume carbohydrates, and you can't choose this, whenever you consume carbohydrates, you release insulin okay, into the bloodstream. The role of insulin is to regulate blood sugar. Okay? It does lots of other things too, but what it generally does is take the sugar from the bloodstream okay, and, put it and store it somewhere, puts it into cells. Now, we'll put it into your muscle cells first, but they have a finite capability to store it. So once they're full, it will be stored in your adipose tissue as fat, okay? and some in your liver as well, but again, there's a finite capacity in the liver. Uh, interestingly, as it goes into your muscles first, we can see that in order to be lean, we want an increase in muscle mass. The more muscle mass you have, the more carbohydrate you can store for energy, the less you're able to store as fat. 
we'll get to that in the exercise section. So, yeah, good question. When you consume uh, carbohydrates, if you were to exercise in the next hour, okay, if you consumed a simple carbohydrate, provided that your muscles weren't already topped up, you'd probably be able to access that 20 to 30 minutes into your exercise session. Okay. If you're thinking of not training until after lunch, but you have to eat before you go to work, then you're looking at what you want to choose is something that keeps your blood sugar stable uh, through the morning rather than a quick rise and then a quick drop. Does that help? Okay. You can't control, uh, well you can control uh, the rate of insulin release through what you eat, but once you've eaten it, you've then flicked the switch. Okay. If you eat high GI carbohydrates, things that are high in simple sugar, you will have a larger release of insulin. And then if you keep doing that all throughout your life, you will develop type 2 diabetes. Okay, so type 1 is the genetic one, uh, the one that you're born with. Type 2 is the insulin resistant uh, type. You can then reverse that. So that's an entirely lifestyle related disease which can be reversed. And you hear in the press how the incidence of type 2 diabetes has risen and it's risen completely in tandem with the rise in consumption of simple carbohydrates. Luckily, you can moderate the action of insulin with the body in several ways. Consuming lower GI foods and also pairing foods with protein because protein has the effect of slowing down metabolism and slowing down the release and breakdown of carbohydrates within the body. I'll show you a little table of some foods to bring it into perspective. So along the top line, we've got low glycemic index foods, medium and high glycemic index foods. So Foods with uh, rapidly absorbed sugar, somewhere in the middle, uh, and foods with sugars that are absorbed very slowly. And then conversely, we've got lots of carbohydrates per gram, a medium amount, and then not very many carbohydrates per gram. And the figures in brackets are GL first and glycemic index second. So if we look at the bottom right-hand corner, there's two interesting additions. We've got cornflakes, okay? with an extremely high glycemic index of 81, considerably higher than table sugar. Okay? So a bowl of cornflakes in your bloodstream faster than if you poured sugar down your throat. And a very, very high glycemic yield. Okay? Similarly, a baked potato, everyone thinks that's the healthy op option for lunch. Well, it can be, I'll tell you why. But it might not be, because faster <laughs> even than sugar uh, to get into your bloodstream and once again an extremely high yield of carbohydrates. If you have a baked potato at lunch and choose to be healthy by not having anything else on it, uh, you'll get a massive spike in blood sugar and then mid-afternoon an enormous crash which is why you have biscuits and lattes and everything else in the afternoon. You can't avoid it, you're setting yourself up for failure. If you go to the canteen and baked potato is the only healthy choice, then pair it with tuna mayonnaise or some grated cheese so you at least give yourself the chance to slow down the release of carbohydrates into the bloodstream. The time to have it would be immediately post-exercise. So let's say that you trained at lunchtime, 12 to 1, did an exercise class and then you went to have lunch afterwards because you immediately post-exercise you want a, a rapid increase in blood sugar to replace that which you burnt off. That would be the time to have the baked potato. Yes? So Adam, is there a your time to eat that after the exercise or a, period, a, a gateway in which you can? Yeah, uh, as soon as possible. So the time to have your, the only time permissible, according to me, it's up to you, the only time permissible to have your simple carbohydrates, and that might be your sports drink, is it 20 minutes after you finish, before, your, before the sweat's dried is the best time, okay? Uh, and you should try and eat within the hour after exercise. If you train hard, for an hour or if you train at all, um, the predominant fuel that you'll use in your exercise will be carbohydrate. It doesn't matter what you're doing. Okay? If you do one sprint for six seconds and then stop, fine, it won't be. But if you train repeatedly for an hour, if you're lifting weights, if you're running, if you're in an exercise class, you will tap into carbohydrate stores and you will deplete them. So you must replenish them. So the time to have the fast-acting carbohydrates 
would be immediately after exercise. The time not to have them is first thing in the morning. If you start the day with cornflakes, you're setting yourself up for a massive failure because once you have a huge insulin spike, uh, you take all the sugar out of the bloodstream, store it as fat, you're then starving hungry, and by mid-morning you'll be reaching for something else to satisfy that craving. So you are not doing, setting yourself up for success if you begin the day without um, a high-protein or a low-glycemic index meal.